Want to expand the influence of design? Pragmatic Institute offers interactive, actionable courses for designers who are looking to contribute more strategically in their organizations. Explore our offerings such as business strategy and design, and influence through storytelling at pragmaticinstitute.com slash design. And welcome to Design Chats, a podcast from Pragmatic Institute, where we sit down with design leaders, practitioners, and alumni to discuss how to grow the strategic impact of design. I am Rebecca Calajaris, Vice President of Marketing and Product Strategy at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. And today I am extremely excited to have on our show, Jared Spool, maker of awesomeness at Center Center, which is also one of my favorite job titles that I think I've ever seen. And he is a passionate advocate for design and its seat at the strategy table and what it means to be a leader. And I think we're just going to have a really great conversation, Jared. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here and for talking with you. Great. So I think one of the things I always like to start is to help people listening get to know you, the person. So tell me a little bit about your sort of journey in design. What first sparked that passion for design and kind of where has it led you? Well, I've always been somewhat of a systems designer. When I look at my childhood, I can pick out things that I did as a kid that were sort of designing systems. I remember when I was five or six years old, I was absolutely fascinated with how the library worked. And it was the system of the library, the mm. idea that you gave them a card and that would then give you a chance to get a book or a set of books. And then you would take the books home and you bring them back and they would somehow make their way on the shelf, back onto the shelf that someone else could borrow. And so I actually took out the family typewriter, which was an old manual typewriter, and I found some paper and I made little library cards and little, because back in the days, you libraries, you, you didn't have barcodes. You had a little card that went into an mm -hmm. envelope in the back of the book that you, that you signed your name to. And, and that's how they figured out who had the book out. And I made these things and I made, and I numbered every book in my house, like <laughs> all my mother's cookbooks. Every book had a little number. I didn't know about the Dewey Decimal System. So I made up a whole numbering scheme based on, I think it was just based on the order of the book as I found it and created a little library in my house, which pissed my mother off <laughs> because I, I, we had some actually fairly rare books and I, def I glued things into oh, the no. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I've always been sort of a systems person and always was fascinated by systems and, and at a very early age, got into computer programming back before that was fashionable for people to do before personal computers. I was working on mainframes and mini computers. And then when personal computers came out, I found myself at the forefront of the personal computer world, designing the very first personal computers for business. And in those days, started thinking about, okay, so how are we going to get business people to use these? Because all the computers that were in use before personal computers were things that were locked in special computer labs. And the people who operated them had special training and special access, but a personal computer would be on your desk and anybody could use it. And so how would you do that? And I found myself at a company called Digital Equipment Corporation, mm -hmm. which was the leading mini computer manufacturer. And they were trying to break into the personal computer market because they, they saw the writing on the wall. And... We were trying to figure out, well, how would an executive or the executive secretary or someone who's not a trained computer engineer actually use these things? I ended up writing some of the first email clients for personal computers and word processors and voicemail systems. I am unfortunately one of the first people to create a voicemail system. So if you hate <laughs> voicemail, it is partially my fault. 
Oh, that's not going to make a lot of sense. One of my claims to <laughs> is on a standard keyboard, you have your main QWERTY array and you have the function keys across the top and you have the numeric keypad on the far right. And you probably have some sort of inverted T set of arrow keys. And then there's six keys in, in sort of a standard PC keyboard that are above the arrow keys that say, insert, delete, page up, page down, home end. That's my design. Wow. I use those all the time. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Makes um, up for the voicemail trees, which... Mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, those are all things I did before the age of 22, basically. Nice. Um, that was a long time ago, back in the late 70s, early 80s. And, then, and that got me interested in what we would now call UX work. And I just went from there. Awesome. I think one of the things that I find interesting about your story too, is like not only sort of the embrace and promotions, not quite advocacy for UX and the importance of UX, but you're, you're very focused on UX leader and leadership as an area that I think just really was speaks to you about just the growth and opportunity that still remains for design to have like as much impact as it can. So talk to me a little bit about leadership and what you mean by UX leadership. So I, I'm in this unusual camp that I think leadership and management are two distinct things. You don't have to be a leader to be a manager. You don't have to be a manager to be a leader. They're not unheard of. They are, I mean, it's not unheard of that they are the same thing, but it's a myth that all managers are leaders or all leaders are managers. And one way to think about it is it's sort of top down or bottom up, right? A manager becomes a manager because the organization has has appointed them as a manager. There's a there's a, some sort of knighthood type ceremony <laughs> that christens them as a manager. And they really only become a manager when they are given direct reports. And leaders, on the other hand, don't need to be christened. They don't need permission. The organization doesn't make them a leader. What makes them a leader is that they get followers. And the reason they get followers is because they have a vision of a future that is so compelling that people are like, I want to do that. I want to mm -hmm. be, I want to become part of that. And now that person could also be a manager, but they, it, it's a completely different thing. One of the things about managers is managers have role power. They have basically a neon sign on their forehead that says, I can get you fired. And everybody who reports to them can see that neon sign. So when a manager asks you to do something, you see the neon sign, you do it. Mm -hmm. Leaders don't have that neon sign. Leaders don't have role power. If you're a leader and you want one of your followers to do something, you have to actually inspire them to do it. They have to want to do it on their own. And that's a really important difference. Leaders, managers are very much about making the team effective, right? How do we make sure that everybody on this team is doing the best work they can do every day, that they have all the tools they need, that they have all the guidance they need, that they understand the mission? You know, a good manager does a fantastic job of making sure that they can do the best job every day. A leader doesn't worry about effectiveness as much. They're about how do we push the vision forward? How do we take this idea, this vision, and make it better. And so a UX leader is someone who has a vision about the user experience, the user experience of something. It could be the user experience that customers have, but it could also be something like the user experience that your developers have, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of, one of the first places that you see real leadership in UX is when someone decides to create a vision around a design system, right? They're tired of every developer having to reinvent the wheel. They want to just have a, a standard set of components that you can mm -hmm. put into your software so that if one part of the program is asking you for a date and another part of the program is asking you for a date, they basically ask you to pick the date the same way. And that two different developers didn't have to create two different date pickers because they didn't know the other one had one or the code wasn't somehow reusable or some other thing. So the leader gets together and says, hey, I, I think we shouldn't have you know, five different types of buttons and four different types of pull downs and two different types of date pickers. Let's create a library and make them reusable and use them like Lego blocks. And someone else says, that's a fantastic idea. I'll help 
contribute to that. And now you've got this bottom up design system. No manager or senior executive said, as a company, our goal for this quarter is to have a design system. That doesn't come till later. Mm -hmm. That starts sort of bottom up. Whereas, you know, as a company, our goal is to increase sales by 15%. That's not a vision. That's just, you know, we need to make more money. That comes top down. Mm -hmm. And so a UX leader is really about, about that. And a good UX leader is really about leading something that is strategically important to the business, but through the lens of user experience. So you take whatever the business objectives are, you take, say, you know, we want to reduce the number of people who quit our application. We want to, we want to reduce churn, keep retention up. I was like, okay, so what's the experience that is causing people to leave? And let's work on making that experience a different experience. So let's have a vision for what that different experience could be. Get people excited about that different experience. And let's fix the problem of retention by developing a better experience that makes people want to stay. And I'll give you an example. So Netflix, I mean, it's very easy to create a retention program that actually makes things worse. (laughs) So I can give you an example of this. It's not unusual when people are dealing with trying to increase retention that they try things like, well, make it a little harder to unsubscribe, right? We've all Mm -hmm. been Mm -hmm. with various cell phone or cable TV vendors who, instead of letting you just quit, offer you alternative packages. What if we give you more for less? You know, all of these things to try and retain you and try and keep you there. And nobody likes that experience. It's a horrible experience. Netflix tried something different. Netflix did some research. And what they found out was the A large percentage of the people who quit Netflix are not doing it because they're unhappy with Netflix. They're not doing it because they think Netflix isn't good for the value. They're doing it because they're on a limited income Mm. and they binged watch their favorite shows and now they don't want to watch. They don't want to pay for Netflix when they don't have a bunch of shows to watch. So Netflix went on a two prong strategy to get people to stick around. And one was, that they focused on investing in content, you know, in in new shows and movies and things that people would stay subscribed for, that they would, when they stopped binging one, they would binge the other. But they also acknowledged that some people just really have a limited income. So they did something unusual. They made canceling the subscription really easy, like one click, no argument, no try to talk you out of it, just one click, Your subscription is canceled, no problem. But they they don't actually cancel your account. They, in essence, just pause it. Hmm. So when you come back, let's say season two of your favorite bingeable show comes back, you can just, with one click, resubscribe. And Hmm. those customers, they end up getting much more lifetime value out of because it's easy to pause, it's easy to come back. And then as they're adding new content, they start to pause and come back much more frequently. And eventually they stop the pausing altogether. And that was how Netflix decided to solve it. That's an experiential approach to actually improving retention and improving revenue without having to go down the path of dirty tricks. And when we focus on the human outcome, when we focus on the experience that somebody has, we do a better job. And so the the question that that I teach UX leaders to ask is, well, if we do a good job, say on retention, if we do a good job on retention, how will we improve someone's life, right? If we ask the question, how does that improve someone's life? We could say, well, someone who's on a limited income can pause it when they need to, but come back when they really want to binge and just pay for the one month and then put it on pause again. And That is a way for us to take any sort of business objective and turn it into something useful. So the UX outcome, you know, if we do a good job, how will we improve someone's life? That 
UX outcome statement starts making everybody think about the experience that people have instead of just the business metrics. One of the things as I was getting ready for this interview and watching a lot of your videos and reading a lot of stuff, one of, you have a couple of things that I just love, right? One is the difference between leadership and managers. And I think that's really empowering for people because it, it's also a reminder that you can be a leader from any position in the organization. Sure. There is nothing holding you back. Right. Right. From, from that. And I think that that's really freeing for people who feel like once I get here or once I have that, I think it's also particularly freeing sometimes for design because there's not just role power in, in the manager, but sometimes there's power within functional areas of an organization. We talk a lot about engineer led organizations or sales led organization where that function has a lot of power. And unfortunately there are less maybe design-led organizations. We definitely see some, but for a lot of organizations and a lot of the people you and I work with, it's not there yet. The maturity of that's not there. And so again, thinking about leadership versus sort of bestowed power really, I think, can be very sort of inspiring in an understanding that you can control a, a lot more of your destiny than maybe you thought you could. Yeah, I think there's definitely something to that. I mean, a leader does not have to wait for permission to start leading. And leadership can have either a big scope or a small scope, right? You just sort of see that a meeting isn't going in the right direction and people are talking about the wrong things. Just by changing the focus of the meeting and maybe the way the conversation is going, you become a leader in that moment. You know, your leadership reign ends at the end of the meeting or maybe even at the end of that agenda item. But for that moment, you were you stepped up, you had a vision of a change, and you decided to be a leader. So we can start to work on leadership in very small mm. pieces and start changing the way conversations have. And just something like saying, okay, I understand we're trying to work on retention. If we do a great job on retention, how does that improve someone's life? We're now changing the direction of the meeting to be more human-centered, even if that conversation only lasts for three minutes. And now we've got a real human in the conversation and having that real human in the conversation is incredibly powerful. Well, we can make the person who doesn't have a lot of money to spend on things feel like they're treating themselves for a month, give them some real value for that treat, and then let them come back and do that again when they have some extra cash and we've got something good for them to watch. And once you frame it that way, it's like, okay, success now looks like when that person can easily pause and easily come mm -hmm. back. And, oh, by the way, we better let them know when there's new stuff. So how are we fixing that part of our process so that when they are paused, we're not annoying them, but we're letting them know about stuff they might really want. So all of a sudden it changes the focus of, I need a retention program to, I need a way to help low cash binge watchers really enjoy treating themselves to us. And that's a very different type of work. And if everybody on the team is there, that's key. One of the other things you said was you talked about being design led. And I have this basic philosophy that every organization is perfectly optimized for the results it's currently getting. Mm. And because they're all optimized to get the results they're currently getting. We can talk in terms of different results, right? If we feel like sales isn't, you know, if sales is very focused and they have a lot of power in the organization for whatever reason, and when sales says something, everybody jumps, that's fine. Is sales getting the results they want? And if not, can we, in the UX design space, can we help design get better results or help sales get better results, right? So, so we don't have to be design-led. We can still be sales-led, but we can actually be the ones who say, you know, there's more than one path to getting good sales results. Hmm. Here's a path we might try and sharing that vision and seeing if we can get them, the people with the role power as followers. And when someone with role power has chosen to follow a leader, Mm -hmm. They basically lend their power to the leader at that point mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the whoever has that power can say, 
you should listen to Rebecca because Rebecca's got this fantastic idea and I think we should invest in this idea. And now everybody who works for that person says, okay, I'm listening to Rebecca. But now Rebecca has to sell it to those people because she doesn't, you don't have any role power for that. So you have to sell this vision to mm-hmm. those people, but you sell it with, hey, I think I know how we can get more sales. We can start focusing on the content instead of bullying people into buying from us. Yeah. And I think one of the, yes, 100% yes. I think one of the other things that I found as someone you know who comes from more of a product management and product marketing background that is smart and also another way to help empower designers, right, is the is just the broad definition of experience, right? Making sure you're really thinking, not like here, uh, you talk a little bit about some designers thinking once the roadmap is solved, I'll start thinking about the UX for those and just really backing that up and thinking like, no, everything as experience, your role and expertise is necessary in every step. It is not a step. Yeah, I I have this view, which not everybody follows, which is this idea that every decision in the organization is a UX decision. Hmm. That certainly the decisions of what gets put on the screen and what the flows are as you move from screen to screen, those are obviously UX decisions. No one really ever argues with that. But there are other things that affect the experience users have. For instance, what feature we're going to work on next affects Mm -hmm. the user's Mm -hmm. experience. What the scope of that feature is affects the user experience. Who is going to be assigned to that project affects the user experience. You know, I hear stories of organizations that have 12 designers and 1,200 developers. (laughs) So uh, a 100 to 1 ratio of developer to designer changes the way that the users have experiences. So now that's affecting it, which means that budgets and headcount, the decisions around that Mm -hmm. are UX decisions. And I would go so far as to say that things that no one has conventionally thought of as a UX decision, things that are traditionally in the realm of pure business decisions, like what regions do we try to sell to next? What's our merger and acquisition strategy? What company do we merge with next? Those are user experience decisions. You know, the region, if we decide to sell into, you know, the Pacific region or Latin America or something like that, well, that has all sorts of UX implications because the cultures and the languages and the way jobs are done change so much that if we know nothing about those regions, we end up creating products that Mm -hmm. turn out to be more colonialist than we'd like and just sort of assume that everybody works the same way we do with the same sort of social norms and, and all those things. And suddenly, you know, that affects the experience users have. And similarly, we've all been on the receiving end of a product that we loved getting acquired by a company that we don't. And the next thing you know, the business model changes and the integrations change and the product becomes much more complex and it loses all the things we loved about it because all that complexity covers that up. And now the experience is much worse than it ever was before. And we inherently know that's a poor user experience, yet at the same time, no one was involved in the diligence effort to make sure that, you know, we're buying this product because all these customers love this product. Okay, how are we going to make sure that they still love it after we buy it? I'm looking at you, Elon. <laughs> <laughs> and and so that's the thing that is fascinating to me is the fact that every decision is a user experience decision. And because of that, that pretty much means that everybody is a user experience designer. Mm -hmm. And they may not be a great designer, they might not even be a good designer. But everybody can be a better designer. So the role of a UX leader starts to shift from trying to do and make all the UX decisions to trying to inform and facilitate all the UX decisions, 
right? How can we make sure that everybody who's making a decision that affects the experience a user will have makes the best decision based on all the things we know and could know? And again, what a powerful combination, right? If the things that you are good at and skilled at really are a common sort of DNA through everything the organization is, and you don't have to be bequeathed power. I mean, right. the opportunity there for you to be a leader and to have strong impact is incredible, right? That, that's absolutely right. We have a program to help people become that type of leader. It's called How to Win Stakeholders and Influence Decisions. Mm -hmm. And in this program, we work on this basic premise of what we call servant leadership. And servant leadership, we didn't create this. This was created by a guy named Greenfield, Robert Greenfield, who, who put the whole idea together. But the idea behind servant leadership is it basically puts you in a position when you're a servant leader to ask the question, how can I use all the experience and knowledge and capabilities available to me to help you succeed. Mm. So I can go to the sales department and I can say, hey, head of sales, how can I give my entire UX experience, all the team members I have, all the knowledge we have in the organization about who our users are and what they need, how can I put that to helping you achieve your sales goals, both in the short term and the long term? And when you start to look at UX work as empowering everybody else in the organization to achieve their goals, you now see it through a fundamentally different lens than I am here to make the thing pretty. Yeah. And they start to see you through a different lens, yeah. which is you have to see it yourself first, but man, like the difference in the different conversations you're brought into, the different ways you're partnered with there allows you to have a lot more impact. But I also think it's it really, it's fulfilling, right? There's, there's so many of these opportunities as designers we see and we, and we know we can unlock. Yeah. And I go back to the company that has 12 designers mm. and 1,200 developers, right? They obviously need more designers, but how many more are they going to get, right? right? I mean, it would be amazing if we could double the number. And you'd still be That would be 24 right? yeah. for yep. 1,200 developers, assuming no, they don't, add any more developers while we're having this conversation. And then, and then, okay, well, maybe they, we could even do four times as many. That'd be 48 designers. That's still a horrible ratio. <laughs> so what if I then look and say, well, what if we, instead of trying to cre increase the number of designers, we increase the amount of design skill that's in the organization? Mm. And specifically, which skills do we need? And if we target the increasing of skills, and we give developers tools and techniques for increasing their skills, then suddenly they can produce more designs. Now, some of that's teaching them basic design stuff, but we can actually avoid doing a whole bunch of that and instead give them scaffolding, it's called, in the educational world. An example is a design system right? If I give them reusable components that uses the right grid and the right type and the right fonts, then they can just apply the components and they, we get something that's better designed without me having to teach them how to use type and fonts and grid. And so now I don't have to teach them the skills of design. I just have to give them a way to design things. I have this kitchen instrument that I use. It's, it's called a sous vide. It's basically a hot tub for meat. <laughs> and it's known actually in the business in you know the the professional cooking business as a precision cooker and what it is is you set a very precise temperature usually to the tenth of a degree you set this temperature to the exact temperature you want the meat to be at so instead of putting meat in an oven or on a grill and cooking it from the outside in you basically raise the temperature of the entire piece of meat to the same temperature. So if you want something to be medium rare, if you want a steak to be medium rare and your target temperature for the inside is 130 degrees, you set the bath to 130 degrees. You put it on, you get it up to speed, you put the meat into it for 45 minutes. It takes longer, but it never goes above 130 degrees, mm. right? The outside never gets burned and you get perfectly medium rare steaks 
by doing this. <laughs> and I always feel like it's cheating because the skill I need to cook oh. on the grill or cook in the oven and not burn the steak and not undercook the steak is far more than just sticking it in a bag and sticking it in a sous vide and cooking it for an hour and just having it always be perfect. Mm. And while I am not a better chef because I can stick a piece of meat in a bag and put it in a, in a hot tub, I am producing better food. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what is more important, my being a better chef or my producing better food? If I'm a designer amongst 12 designers, there might be two projects that I could spend my week on where I could really provide value. But it's a ratio of 100 developers to one designer. So what am I going to do with the other 98 developers? Yep. If I could give them the equivalent of a sous vide and they could get a decent, not the world's best, but a decent design out without me having to lift a finger, we've made the everything the company produces better without having to hire an army of designers. That doesn't mean we shouldn't hire more designers. More designers will allow us to do those things that the sous vide can't do because mm -hmm. it can't do everything. Right. But it can do so many things. You know, if we can just teach developers to stop vomiting the database onto the screen, <laughs> that's a huge improvement. You know, and I think it's one of those things that you think, okay, sometime I'll have the time to make these big changes, right? It's like the important versus the urgent that mm -hmm. we're so busy putting out the fire from the 98 developers that we don't have time in our mind to do the work that would create that, that sort of system of place. So what kind of tips do you give your students? What would you give people that's like trying to carve out the time for the umbrella work in the midst of all the firefighting? Well, you have to first know what is important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're describing what's known in the consulting world as the Eisenhower matrix, right? So you've got four boxes on two dimensions, urgent, not urgent, important, not important. And so the things we want to focus on are urgent and important and important, but not urgent. Mm -hmm. Things that are urgent, but not important, or things that are neither urgent nor important, we can just go and ignore. So we want to focus on those things that are both urgent and important. We want to focus on all the important things, whether they're urgent or not. That's, that's the better way of thinking about that. Okay. So urgent and important, that's a firefighting effort. Mm -hmm. And that's very reactive. But important requires that we think in terms of being proactive, because if we just listen to urgency and we prioritize everything based on urgency, we never get to the stuff that's not urgent, whether it's important or not. And so this idea of starting with the end in mind, right, where are we trying to get to? And the idea of moving beyond outputs to outcomes. So an output is something we deliver. We deliver a new release of code. We deliver a new version of the app. We deliver a new set of wireframes. We deliver something to QA, right? All of these things are, are outputs. And if we measure success in terms of how many outputs we've had this year, we don't have any notion of quality in that, right? We can, you know, once you remove quality as a requirement, everything becomes a lot easier and faster. <laughs> So if we just take away the, the requirement of quality, we can deliver a lot of stuff over the next few months because we, we just throw it out there. And if we want to make sure there's quality involved, then we have to define, well, what's good enough? And we can define what's good enough in terms of outputs. Well, if we've done three of these, that's good enough. But that still doesn't get to the quality because I do three crappy ones. That's not the same as three really good ones. So what's the difference between something that's crappy and something that's really good? Well, that's the change that happens in the world because we did this. And that's what an outcome is, mm -hmm. right? So if I deliver a product that helps us increase retention, what's the change I want to see? So that's why we ask the question, if we do a good job, how will we improve someone's life? Because the improving of someone's life, that's the outcome. That's the change in the world that we want to see. And if we focus on that, everything else falls into place. Because by focusing on the change, then we know when we're done. And 
we can say, wait a second, we've produced a lot of outputs. We did that very urgently, but we still haven't seen the change in the world. Okay, we're not done. Or we might find out that we get to the change in the world much sooner than we expected, and we can stop the urgency of producing more outputs. And so this gives us much more control over what we end up working on and gets everybody on the same page. Asking that question, if we do a great job on whatever this thing we're working on is, how does it improve someone's life? Either we are all in agreement or we're not. And if we're not in agreement, then we should stop until we get an agreement because we're all building something different. And if we can't answer the question in the first place, if we don't know how this thing, you know, we're working on optimizing the underlying database code. Okay, if we do a great <laughs> job optimizing the underlying database code, how do we improve someone's life? If we can't answer that question, why are we doing it? Somewhere, somehow, it's got to affect someone's life. Otherwise, why do we need to optimize it? I think one of the things that's so powerful about your Netflix example is it gives you both the way we affect someone's life, lower income or fixed income, being able to binge shows they love with ease, but it also ties directly to the corporate metric income, right? It Or mm -hmm. goal. It ties directly to sort of recurring revenue and turning down churn. And I think that connection, both from the inspirational size of experience that rallies people and gets them to trolley your vision, but all the way to the impact it has on the organization is just really important. It's that tie that I know you talk about in your, and in your multi-week courses, what we talk about in our course is like, you have to connect the experience work you're doing to something very tangible in the organization, not to get people to follow you, but to get to, to some extent people to fund you or to even understand the piece. And I, I think that's why it's such a great example that you use there because it has both sides. Yeah. If we can make human centered, every decision the business makes have a side of it. You can think of it as two sides of the same coin, right? One side has the business improvement. The other side has the improvement in someone's life. You can't have a one-sided coin. It makes it really hard to flip. <laughs> so it's got to be a two-sided coin. So now that two-sided coin becomes really powerful in the organization because they have, to, they have to work together. If they don't work together, then we're not going to achieve the results. Right? We can bully some folks in the short term, but long term, it's not going to work out for us. And we're going to mm -hmm. have to find new ways to bully people. And nobody really wants to be contributing to that. Mm -hmm. But you make things more meaningful, right? Meaningful, the best definition I've heard of, of meaningful, I got from Stefan Sagmeister. We were having dinner one time and talking about this. And he, he said, well, to me, my work becomes meaningful when by doing my work, I see the improvement in someone else's life. Hmm. And I had never thought of it that way, but that that's such an elegant definition is, you know, what... I really want a meaningful job. Okay, what does a meaningful job mean? Well, it means that when I do a good job, someone else's life gets better. And you can be a, a gate agent at an mm -hmm. airline. Mm -hmm. And if you do a good job helping that family that, you know, somehow got their four family members strategically spread around the plane so that nobody was sitting with anybody else, and you can get them a row to themselves so that they're all sitting together and the mother's not worrying, and you know all of those things are happening. If you can get to that moment, you've just made their flight better. You can take a win, and you can say, okay, yep. I just improved their experience on my airline. Now, there's a question as to why the reservation system spread them across the plane to begin with, and could we actually reduce the frustration that gate agents encounter when a family comes up and one of the parents is in full mama bear mode and and is like you have put my two-year-old sitting between two fat sweaty guys i want my two-year-old sitting next to me how do we make that happen right okay well as the developer of the reservation system can i come up with a way to make sure that families of four with small children 
always get seated together, mm-hmm. right? And that's a different challenge. But now we've made that programmer's life more meaningful. And mm-hmm. if I can build a design system and some AI agents that detect when there are ch- families with children, and I can actually create business rules and policies to make sure we have rows available for those passengers. Now, as a business analyst inside the airline, I can make that developer's life better, right? That chain just keeps going. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. All right, Jared, we have talked about a lot of different things today. We sure Uh, have. We have, right? Mm -hmm. But if you were going to have listeners do two things differently tomorrow based on what we talked about today, what would you do? What would you tell well, them? first, they should have taken notes. So they should listen to this podcast again. <laughs> Excellent taking advice. Notes. So here's, here's the first thing I would do. Try to make it a habit, right? And it, and it takes, I read some book somewhere that was written by someone who I don't think knows anything about what they're talking about, but I believe <laughs> them anyways, which is that it takes 60 times of repeating something to make it a habit. So think of the next 50 meetings you're going to have. Mm-hmm. And start each meeting asking, okay, this thing we're talking about in the meeting today, if we do a good job of that, how will that improve someone's life? Even if it's a meeting that's about the same thing that you met about yesterday, ask the question again anyways, because there might be new people in the room, or we might have forgotten, or something in the world might have changed that that's no longer the way we're going to improve their life. For whatever reason, we should just get in the habit of starting every meeting this way. And then at the end of the meeting, asking if we are closer to improving someone's life than we were at the start of the meeting. And just those two questions alone would be huge. And then the other thing that I would look at is that for people to really grow, they have to learn. And we have to create a culture of continuous learning. So... It's not just every day reflecting on what you've learned and how you're going to use that going forward. But what if that became a thing that you just asked all of your peers every day? Hey, what did you learn today? And how are you going to use that going forward? Mm. And it can be small. It can be big. It can be something to do with work. It can be something to do with, you know, how you pay your tax bill. It doesn't really matter except. The whole point of this is, could we create a culture where we're just continually learning? Mm. Everybody, every single one of us is continually learning. Because if we can constantly be learning, then we can do things because we've learned that that's the way to do it, not because that's the way we've always done it. Oh, it's one of my least favorite phrases. It's the way we've always done it. Exactly. (laughs) Powerful questions we should ask ourselves, Jared. Thank you so much. It's been a genuine pleasure having you on today. I've had a lot of fun. Thank you for making this really delightful. Excellent. All right. For those listening, if they want to learn more, Jared, where should where should they come find out about you? The best place is to join our community, Leaders of Awesomeness. It's free. It's for people who want to be better leaders in the UX world. If you just Google Leaders of Awesomeness, the last time I checked, it's the top thing that comes up. And so leaders.centercenter.com, but the easiest way is just to Google Leaders of Awesomeness. And then you can join us and you can join the various free sessions we have and take advantage of the resources that we provide. And, you know, maybe someday there's, there, you'll want to join one of our programs. Uh, we're going to do a program next year on metrics and how to identify the right metrics to, to that actually persuade important strategic decisions in your organization. So, you know, maybe you'd want to join that. Excellent. All right, Jared, thank you so much for the time and for lending your expertise and your perspectives to Design Chats. Oh, again, thank you for so much for your time and making this such a quick, delightful conversation. Absolutely. All right, that does it for today's episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening. (laughs) 